And, and here everybody comes. Excellent. Yep. Like so. Oh, that's that was quick. Yeah. Just just like that with the Zoom. So Thank we're you. everybody's coming on and we'll get started in a few few minutes. We've got a big crowd today, so we're very excited about that. Um so yeah, so I think we've got our, our largest largest group so far so thank you all for joining us um actually I, I will go ahead and jump into it so um so i wanted to welcome everybody to our uh shelter series event my name is clarissa goodlett and i'm the communications director at preservation north carolina and so during this time when sheltering has become a central part of our lives we wanted to create a space to connect with you to explore the culture, architecture, diversity, and stories of the many buildings and houses that serve as shelters across our state. Um, this is one of several shelter series events scheduled for this year, and you can uh, register for our upcoming shelter series events at preservationnc.org. Uh, uh, so this afternoon, we are excited to present Wilmington, Lost But Not Forgotten at the Beach. Um, and we'll have our uh, director of the Bellamy Mansion Museum, Gareth Evans, presenting with us. And then we'll be doing a Q&A. And we have a, a panel of experts joining us for the Q&A session. And they are historian and author Beverly Tetterton, uh, volunteer chair at Federal Point Historic Preservation Society, Elaine Henson, the Education and Collections Coordinator at Old Baldy Foundation, Travis Gilbert, uh, volunteer historian at Federal Point Historic Preservation Society, uh, Rebecca Taylor, and uh, the Executive Director at the Wrightsville Beach Museum of History, uh, Madeline Flagler. And so you can see all those folks are on, on the screen right now. Uh, once Gara starts, we'll turn off our video and just kind of focus on the presentation, but these are the folks who will be joining us afterwards. So thank you so much for that. Um, and just quickly before I turn it over to Gareth, I want to go over some um, FYIs about the webinar and, and asking questions. So I'm going to share my screen with you all. All right. Let's see here. Okay. So um, as you all can tell, everyone is muted. Um, your video is disabled except for our panelists, so we can't see or hear you, but uh, we know you all are there. So thank you all for coming. coming. Um, this is being recorded and live streamed. And so it'll be available um, later on our channels. You can check it out on our webpage. Um, it'll be available on our YouTube page and also on our Facebook page. And that's where it's streaming live. If you have any tech issues, um, please utilize the chat function and we'll try to assist you. If there are folks checking out the chat and you see somebody has a question that you know the answer to, please um, answer the question. We'd love to have our, our um, assistance crowdsourced um, whenever possible. So that's perfectly fine with us. Um, and then down at the bottom, you have um, that bar and that is the bar uh, the the bar that you all should have as uh, attendees. So that's the the chat function. Um, you can raise your hand or the Q&A. And so we'll be holding questions till the end of the presentation. Um, and the way that you can ask a question is one to click on that little Q&A um, down at the bottom and then type in your question. You can do that anonymously or um, use your name there. And I'll be keeping track of those and, and um, and referring to that and ask those questions of our panelists. You can also type in the chat um, or you can raise your hand. And um, at the end, I'll go to the raise hands and I can unmute you and you can ask your question live. And then finally, if you guys will just take a few minutes at the end, um, when you close out of the webinar, there'll be a pop-up with a survey. 
um, is super helpful for us to understand, you know, what things we're doing well, um, where we can improve, and then also um, if you have thoughts or ideas on other shelter series topics that you want to see, we'd love to hear that feedback as well. And then if you're interested, um, because we don't get to see you during the webinar, but we do want to see you, if you want to join us for a little social night, so, uh, excuse me, socializing and networking after the webinar, you can join us for a um, little Zoom after party meeting where we usually continue uh, the discussion. And so that is a link there. And I will post that link again in the chat um, on the webinar. And that is it for me. And I'm going to turn it over to Gareth. All right, thanks very much. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. If anybody's not muted, could you uh, hit mute about now? Um, I am going to share my screen and we'll get started. Uh, my slideshow. All righty, uh, I will hide myself, but First up, thanks so much to everybody for coming. We have a great crowd. Um, I know that Clarissa will jump in and tell me if I'm not speaking loudly enough or if I'm going too slowly or anything like that. So that's, that's very helpful. Um, I wanted to do a few thanks to start with uh, to Beverly Tetterton, of course, who I think is still on the screen there, for writing this book, Wilmington Lost But Not Forgotten, uh, which has a section on the beaches, some of them that we'll be talking about today. Uh, it's a wonderful book. It's out of print, but there is a, a Kindle edition to it. So you can grab on that. I'm going to turn my video off right now. There we go. All right. There's so much in the book uh, and in that Kindle edition that this presentation is something of a, a highlight reel in a way, if you think of it that way. Uh, there are stories in each beach uh, that we'll go to that could easily fill an hour each. Even more information has come from the other panelists here, Madeline Flagler at Wrightsville Beach Museum, Elaine Henson, Rebecca Taylor from Federal Point Historic Preservation Society, that's at Carolina Beach, and Travis Gilbert at Old Baldy, Old Baldy Museum. And there's a lot to cover, and thanks to them for giving me so much to choose from. Okay. The North Carolina coast uh, should be very familiar to all of you. Uh, it sort of sticks out like a chin, and as we'll find out, hurricanes tend to come up and sort of get it with an uppercut quite often. Um, you'll see that there's a certain level of craziness to living on a beach like this. Uh, the ones maybe out of Cape Hatteras is particularly out there, but all the way down, this is such a fragile place to be. Uh, it's dangerous. It's a moving, shifting sand, you know? Inlets get created and filled up. Hurricanes, nor'easters sweep in, and as we'll find out, fires happen. And often there's not the infrastructure necessarily to handle those fires when you get there. Um, you'll see just by looking at this how precarious all the towns living on what is really a conveyor belt of sand uh, are. I wanted to start with hurricanes because, as you'll see, it's like a formative natural event uh, for all these places. This first one is Hurricane Hazel. It landed on October 15th, 1954. It's the only category four hurricane to hit the Carolinas. And to give you context, that's 130 to 156 mile an hour sustained winds. That's a beast. Uh, it landed at Calabash, which is right near the, Carolina, the border of the two Carolinas, at the year's highest tide, which meant an 18 foot storm surge. So wherever you're sitting now, imagine 18 feet of water coming at you if you're at sea level. On Oak Island, which is across uh, the Cape Fear from Southport, and also across from uh, Bald Head Island, only five of 357 buildings remained. You see the devastation. This is sort of a selection of Southport, Carolina Beach, and some other places um, that we'll visit. But basically, it's, it's a similar story all up and down the coast in, in that year, with no particular warning either. It killed 95 people in the US and had a huge impact on the beaches we're discussing, causing millions in damage at the time. So you can adjust for inflation. I put in, because uh, I love Ocracoke Island, but Hurricane Florence in September of 2018 uh, also obviously came here. 
uh, to Wilmington. It came all up and down the coast. In fact, it kept on track, landed as a Category 1, uh, and caused this much damage for a Category 1. It's kind of an astonishing thing. It took the roof off the building that I work at, the Bellamy Mansion, part of that, and caused so much damage. Uh, it's just an astonishing event. This is the kind of thing that just upends um, beaches, uh, communities, even to today. Now, the next one, I wanted to just bring it all the way up today because I know there's a hurricane landing in the Gulf today. But uh, Isaias, a hurricane landed just a few weeks ago uh, in August of this month. And this is what it did. So that's Oak Island, um, an Ocean Isle beach, top left. Basically, it took the beach and put it in the road. Uh, the fires were caused often by salt water getting into golf cart batteries and exploding and igniting fires. I never would have thought of that down there. And the Southport shot is a Southport Marina. If you've been there at any point, you'll know what a beautiful spot that is. It's just a jumble of boats. Now, this is a category one hurricane coming in. So I'm gonna take you back to Her Hazel and uh, think about what Her four did when it came in. And this is the geography of the area that we're dealing with. Wrightsville Beach to the north, um, we track on down past the empty Masonborough Island. Sea Breeze is on the mainland. Carolina Beach and Curie Beach occupy one island. And then actually Baldhead Island is connected by the beach. It's not an island anymore. However, it, it was once upon a time, of course. You'll see from that Civil War map I put in the bottom right-hand corner that there was an inlet. It was opened in 1761 by a hurricane and closed in 1871 by the Army Corps of Engineers, making Baldhead Island contiguous with the rest of the coast. So this is the area that we're gonna be dealing with, those sort of uh, north to south beaches as we go. And you can see that the river on one side has a whole ecosystem on the sea and the other does the same. We start at Wrightsville Beach. Uh, Wrightsville Beach is this narrow strip of land next to the ocean. Harbor Island is the barrier island in between. And then the Intracoastal Waterway divides that uh, from the mainland. Harbor Island's a low-lying area. It was once named the hammocks between the mainland and barrier island. On one side is the Intracoastal, and then the other is Banks Channel, that body of water. In 1888, a seashore railroad went there from Wilmington and later onto the beach. In 1916, the Tidewater Power Company, which owned the railway, commissioned prolific, and I mean prolific, local architect Henry Bonnets to design a 2,000 seater, I'll get to that one, this 2,000 seater auditorium, and people flocked from across the state to concerts, theater performances, and conferences by the sea. In 1927, a housing development, Shaw Acres, figured that housing was more profitable and this auditorium was raised. You see here for a second how undeveloped, relatively speaking, this was in the 1950s. If you go back across the 1900, far less so. But if you've ever been to Wrightsville Beach, you know how built up it is today, just from this one angle. The streetcar or the beach car. It depends where you, whether it's on the mainland or on the beach, I think I found in, in my reading. Um, in the early 20th century, the main way to the beach was by streetcar. The Tidewater Power Company again built this link from Wilmington to Wrightsville. But the Wilmington Street Railway Company uh, was chartered in 1887. And at the start, it was a horse-drawn system, later electrified, and stayed mostly downtown in that period. This came later. You're looking at a map from 1910 here which I just find fascinating to see. What a great way to travel. The Belt, pictured on the right in 1915, was the first of these streetcars. Then streetcar suburbs appeared all around downtown over the decades that followed, and as a result directly of this public transport system. Places like Sunset Park and Carolina Place and Carolina Heights. Uh, the 1910 top left image uh, shows that when you left downtown, which was not that developed, you know, not that huge at the time, it was a ride through countryside, farmland really, to get to the water. Something that if you drove through Wilmington is just kind of unimaginable now. In the 1880s, train service was begun by the Wilmington and Seacoast Railroad with a trestle and tracks first to Harbor Island 
and then Wrightsville. Hotels, of course, entertainment, yacht clubs, and much else followed. In 1902, 100 cottages were on the island. And that year, the streetcar beach line we just saw appeared from Wilmington and became an instant hit, leading, of course, to yet more development. You can see the line on the bottom one there of Lumina Avenue here and its relationship to the old beach car route. So the top picture, you see that sweep of the beach car track. And down below, you see that sweep in South Lumina Avenue as it came over a different bridge and went through what is station one, those two buildings down there with the white roofs and on down the beach. You'll notice, of course, that Wainick, which is the main road on the right hand side of the island as we're looking at it, wasn't there uh, in 1915. That was built in the uh, 1930s. So rails, uh, you know, or boats, of course, were the only way onto the island. This footbridge accompanied the rail one and facing you as it came off this bridge was station one. On your left though would be the Oceanic Hotel, a big yellow building in this picture. And further down Lumina Avenue at station seven was the Lumina Pavilion and we'll get to all those very shortly. The current road bridge looks dull. It's in that inset there by comparison, but actually that's got my favorite view, probably in Wilmington, of Banks Channel. It's just beautiful out there. And I did a lot of this on Google Earth and I can't recommend that highly enough for you to go exploring the world. Go to the bridge and have a look at Banks Channel. It's gorgeous. Station one began as an open shelter. And by the 1920s, this area was home to convenience stores and hotels. Mr. and Mrs. Lester Newell ran Station One itself, selling drinks and sandwiches, expanding into a beach themed retailer by the 1950s. Eventually, that became the Wings Store that you still see there today. The rail system falters due to the onset of cars and then the 1935 building of a road bridge to the beach. You can still see the old trestle rail bridge in this 1959 photo though. <clears throat> a roadway was deemed necessary after a huge fire in 1934, which destroyed much of Northern Wrightsville Beach. And we'll get back to that. Overall, the streetcars and beach line finally vanished in 1939-40, but Wilmington was the last North Carolina city to give them up. And hopefully one day we'll get them back. Move on down the road to Lumina Pavilion. In 1905, Beach Girl Station 7 was the site of one of the most memorable landmarks on the beach or anywhere. Designed again by Henry Bonnets, the Consolidated Railway Light and Power Company put up a pavilion 300 feet long, two stories high, with a bowling alley, changing rooms, ladies' parlor, lunch room, and amusements on the ground level. Above was a dance floor, 50 by 70 feet, with a spectator promenade and an orchestra section. Thousands of bulbs from the power company made this place a really visually spectacular site, and of course led to its name, Lumina. Its nicknames, one of them, included uh, the Showplace of the Atlantic. And surprisingly, it was a huge hit. By 1909, the ballroom doubled in size, and by 1913, 830 people could be seated and a new terrace over the porches called the Hurricane Deck appeared. All the big bands of their generation came to play ragtime, jazz, and swing. Look at that down there in the bottom right. That's just fantastic. Over time, what was an initial Victorian reserve, no close dancing, no alcohol, coats and ties for the men and chaperones as well, that kind of faded away. Through the 1930s, Lumina hit its peak. Early in the decade, Wrightsville was still only reached by boat or rail. It was also segregated, of course, meaning Lumina and this area of Wrightsville Beach remained whites only. In 1939, Tidewater Power and Light sold Lumina to some local businessmen. And then the car bridge and Wainick Boulevard by that time, of course, had been built. World War II brought troops on leave and big name acts like Cab Calloway and Vaughan Monroe played. These are kind of a sad, these are sad shots. Anyway, um, it was post-war that brought a decline though. Uh, big bands were out of fashion and a skating rink replaced the dance floor. Sacrilege to some locals. 1954, Hurricane Hazel came up and caused serious damage here. 
But in 1962, there was a mild renaissance with an extended deck, new dance area and amusements. And that brought in patrons. But again, changing fashions yet again, and the expense of a huge wooden building in need of repair meant that in May 1973, the wonderful landmark came down. On the bottom right there are the condos that uh, pretty much replaced it on that site right now. Next up we have Tarrymore Oceanic Hotel. In 1905, just north of Station One, and you saw it earlier, the yellow building, W.J. Moore of Charlotte built the Tarrymore. It spanned much of the island from Banks Channel to the ocean and had 125 rooms with phones, private bath, and electric lights. And I'm, I'm gonna throw in here that from 1904 to 1917, Consolidated Railways, light and power, supplied the beach with free electricity, which was to say the least helpful, it'd be helpful now. This hotel had an artesian well, which provided good water. There was excellent food, billiards, card rooms, a bowling alley, a 4,000 square foot ballroom and a saloon. In 1911, it was sold and grew even more, adding two large wings and moving the entrance from the center to the corner. You can see it as you go up the slide here, where that huge Queen Anne Tower was built. The name was changed and it was called the Oceanic and it was a hub to rival Lumina. In fact, orchestras played in the dining room and then hopped on a beach car to play down the street in Lumina. It had a dock on Banks Channel to take guests for a trip to the ocean. The huge fire we've heard about destroyed it and all but two cottages on the north end of the developing island in 34. What you see on this picture, the Tower 7 restaurant right there, marks roughly where the hotel began as it stretched to the sea. So, if you imagine somewhere near that corner is somewhere near the corner where that huge tower is and off down to the ocean, you get some kind of idea. That night postcard is fantastic as well. You see the streetcar inside it right there. And again, the idea that 103 buildings are leveled, including that hotel with a loss of a million dollars shows you how much inflation has gone up since 1934. Next, we have the Seashore and Ocean Terrace Hotel. One of the first hotels at Wrightsville was the Seashore. It opened in 1897 with 198 feet of ocean frontage and was designed yet again, I said it was prolific, by Henry Bonnets. It proved so popular that within a year, a 30 room annex was added. In 1910, a one of a kind, and this is cool, 700 foot steel pier was built, connected directly to the hotel's veranda, promenade area. At the ocean end, you see there, there was a two story pavilion and an observation deck. A series of storms from 1919 to 21 damaged and then destroyed the pier, which was never rebuilt. So it only lasted about a decade. 1919 was a particularly bad year as fire destroyed the hotel as well. A new three-story version was built in 1922 with elegant ensuite rooms, dining and entertaining. In 1935, the name changed to Ocean Terrace, but in 1954, guess what happened? Hurricane Hazel caused huge damage. And by 1955, the building, well, and then in 1955, the building burned to the ground. You see it in his last throws there. The empty site of all of this activity became the Blockade Runner, which is still standing happily. It was the Blockade Runner Motor Hotel in 1964, in a mid-century modern style, new to the beach. It was the first modern high-rise hotel at seven stories, and remains today in the hands of one of the families that built it. Moving on down the road to Carolina Beach Yacht Club. In 1853, way back, seven men organized the second oldest yacht club on the East Coast. The beach was not yet named Wrightsville, it was called Ocean View, and a waterway called Deep Inlet still split the island, long since filled in. The club was a small building for the simple purpose of racing boats up Banks Channel to the sea. In 1897, a larger building with a veranda appeared, but in 1899, a hurricane destroyed that. 
Undeterred, members built a two-story structure with a large upper and lower porches and a multi-purpose room, lounge and bar. Large wings contained bathhouses, one for men, one for women, and a canopy greeted visitors off the beach car line. The boats were moored in Beck's Channel, but in 1954, Hazel claimed this as a victim too. However, in 1955, a replacement with those distinctive locker rooms was built with bar, dining room, multi-use room as well, and that still stands. Hanover Seaside Club, German immigrants from Hanover, built the original Seaside Club in 1898 in Carolina Beach, known as Federal Point down in that part of the, further south. The roads were poor and the trip from Wilmington was by boat and then train called the Shoe Fly, and we'll see that later. But by 1906, the advent of beach cars to Wrightsville made it convenient to have a new clubhouse there and build it near Lumina. Henry Bonnets was a member and of course designed the building. As you see, it had big verandas on each of its three stories, and a card room, bowling alley, bathhouses, and dining. The third floor had 14 rentable rooms for members to stay during the summer. For 75 years, the Seaside Club entertained in rambling style, I love rambling buildings, until it burned in December 1981. However, as you'll notice from, as we go through all this stuff, people on beaches are a hardy bunch, by 1983, a new, very similar version had appeared and is still there. Move on to Johnny Mercer's Pier. In the 1940s, a bait shop could be found on the beach on Salisbury Street. It marked the start of the mammoth 912 foot Johnny Mercer's Pier, although back then it was known as the Atlantic View Fishing Pier. It became a fixture of all beach visits for many years. The shop moved onto the pier over time, and charged admissions. They installed pinball machines, sold souvenirs, concessions, and beachwear. I'm gonna pause a second wherever you are, right? And there's a couple of hundred people on here, I think. Think of the waves, that's the salt air, and that hot dog and donuts and fries smell on a warm summer evening. The stuff you only get at beaches. Right, I've had a moment of that. And of course, 1954 Hazel, as everywhere else, came up and wreaked havoc. But when rebuilt in a different forms afterwards, the pier was still susceptible to many storms, but you could drive onto the beach into the 1960s because this was a relatively undeveloped stretch towards the north end of Wrightsville and still see the pier. A man named Johnny Mercer was the owner at this point in the 60s. He was a genial host for the post-Hazel period. It was his death in a car wreck in 1964 that led to the name sticking to this day. In 1996, Hurricane Fran hammered the wooden pier into the sea yet again. So in 2003, this concrete replacement, which is still there, was built. Shell Island, which is the sort of northern point, as you see up there of Wrightsville Beach, the northernmost end. Shell Island is one of two African-American resorts in New Hanover County during the segregation era. As with Sea Breeze and Freeman Park further south, which we'll see in a bit, it was reached by water. Passing through the white areas of beach towns might have caused conflict, but another reason, which you can't see on this current image, is that Moore's Inlet separated the northernmost part of Wrightsville Beach from the rest until the 1970s. You can see where the inlet was here by looking at what's on this map anyway, called Big Lollipop Bay. Well, that used to go right through. That was the, that divided Shell Island at the top here. Dr. F. W. Avent, a noted physician in the city, was a chief organizer of the Shell Island Resort. In 1923, it was established under the title of National Negro Playground, the nation's first such beach. There was a ferry at the inlet, and L. T. Rogers, a white contractor, built a large pavilion which featured nightly jazz and boardwalks on the island. A restaurant and cottages followed. It was successful and Tidewater Power Company extended the beach car line in that direction. Sadly, this was all short-lived. In 1926, a fire in a dining area ruined the pavilion and left just a few buildings standing. 
And despite attracting attention from all over the country, the resort wasn't rebuilt and the area left mostly empty. The inlet filled and development moved north over time until a large resort was built there in the 1980s and that building still stands. Brings us to beach cottages in general. From its development and through much of the 20th century, the beach was a place to go really only for the summer. There were relatively few year-round uh, residents. Beach cars could take you there for a few hours, maybe after work or on weekends, and gender roles being what they were, it was often women with kids relaxing out there. Even though, as we read, bathing suits came in during the 1920s, there were still those scandalized by women's attire and they were sending pearl clutching letters to the editors into the 1930s. At both Carolina and Riceville beaches, the summer cottages that appeared over all these years were simple buildings, actually easily rebuilt, which is handy too. The typical cottage was inexpensive with shingle or siding. It had top hinge shutters, with spacious and airy. Usually they were built on piling so water could pass underneath and they featured large rocking chair porches facing the beach. Inside, they were equally simple. Cot beds that could be moved outside for breezes, wicker furniture and rust colored water, not the best. There are some examples here. The one in the top right sold for 850 bucks in 1920. The WH Northrop cottage was an extended rambly version that you see. And preservationists tried to save the Bledenthal, which looks like Bluthenthal, uh, because it has elements dating to the 19th century, but couldn't, and that was lost in 2016. Hurricanes are one pressure on the beach. Fire, like the 1934 one, uh, which is pictured here, actually, the devastation in the bottom corner, bottom left, showing the places where cottages used to be in the names of the owners. That's another pressure. Today, it's mostly about, it's often about money. Land prices in a small area like this, which everyone wants to go to, mean that keeping an historic cottage on a beach is difficult. It's more profitable often to take it down and put something new and large in its place. But to a preservationist, you lose so much character, this kind of character when you do that. If the large hotels weren't for you, more homey family inns would be found at Wrightsville and Carolina beaches. Most were larger two or three level buildings, but with no more than 20 rooms and probably a communal bathroom, possibly a dining room. The Glen was a fondly remembered holdout in later years and a preservation push couldn't quite save it in 2008. Kitty Cottage, meanwhile, was the starting point of the January 1934 blaze that destroyed those 103 buildings, cottages, guest houses, and the Oceanic. It was winter at the beach, and so it was mostly empty and a few boarders were reportedly playing poker. A resident nearby saw smoke, but by the time neighbors went to investigate, the roof was on fire. A bucket brigade, a line of buckets handed in, one to the next, all the way to Banks Channel failed, and it was a dry, windy day. There was no fire department to speak of and no road. So help had to come from Wilmington, but couldn't really get there. On the bright side of all this, of all the devastation that ensued, no one was killed. And after the disaster, rebuilding was done in months on cottages and the new road and causeway appeared. And that helped, it also changed the island and its character permanently. Move down the coast, at the end of New Hanover County, uh, you cross Snow's Cut, you see various things to note here, sea breeze across to Freeman Park, we'll get to that story. The whole area is called Pleasure Island and it's the tip of the Federal Point Peninsula cut off from the mainland by the 1931 creation of Snow's Cut. It gets you from the river to the channel. The beach community called Pleasure Island is split. The island itself features towns of Carolina and Curie beaches, and then Freeman Park, and to the south, Fort Fisher. We'll call it at Sea Breeze, where the intracoastal meets Snow's Cut as well. Pleasure Island shares plenty of features with Wrightsville. One of them is Lost Inns. They're successful for many years. They feature repeat visitors. They're homey, as I said, affordable. But the drawback was that other retail and land uses were often more profitable than running an inn. I, just, I love the name, the Wanda Inn, by the way, down there. Really like that. 
But how do you get down there? You saw where it was on the end of the peninsula. Because Carolina Beach, Lux Wrightsville, didn't have good access roads in its early years, the best way to get there into the 1900s was a steamboat named Wilmington from downtown at Market Street. Once you'd sailed down the Cape Fear River, you were met by a small train called a shoe fly and taken to places like Carolina Beach Pavilion. You see it there on top right. The New Hanover uh, Transit Company arranged the train and was therefore instrumental in developing the beach by providing the transport. Captain John Harper, meanwhile, was the owner of the steamboat, the Wilmington. He built the pavilion in 1884, and of course it was designed by Henry Bonnet, as part of a hotel complex. Harper built the attraction and owned the mode of arrival, but it burned in 1910, and a replacement burned in 1914, uh, 1940, sorry. There's the shoe fly crossing a channel right there. It looks a little lethal to me, but there we are. These are brave folks as well. Some of the rail remnants that got you down into that part of the world can be seen basically as the wide medians. And this one's in the aptly named Harper Avenue from Captain Harper today. Carolina Beach had its hotels as well in 1929. The new State Highway 40 to Carolina Beach brought more opportunity for growth. The 50-room Ocean View opened in 1930, the same year as James and Florence Bame opened their eponymous three-story hotel on Cape Fear Boulevard, quite nearby. It burned in the same 1940 fire that destroyed the pavilion, but was rebuilt, only to be demolished in 1976. Pretty short-lived. In 1936, the Royal Palm here was built by oil distributor WC Fountain. It changed its name to the Aster in 1983 and was struck by arson in 2005. The family owned Greer Motel, catered later to a more mobile post-World War II crowd, but such motels disappeared fast in the 2000s when high-rise development was allowed on Carolina Beach. The boardwalk, perhaps the most distinctive area of Carolina Beach, is the boardwalk. Home to bars and restaurants, bingo, bowling, souvenirs, arcades, and the venerable Brit's Donuts. It's the entertainment center of the beach. It's been that since the 1930s. During World War II, Seashore Amusement Park offered Ferris wheel rides, a carousel and bumper cars. Plus, what I think is kind of a, a lethal sounding chair ride off a pier up out above the ocean. Everybody survived apparently. In the 1970s, the amusements moved and then they closed in 2005. But in recent years, this old fashioned carnival feel with rides has returned and a new wooden promenade has been added to the boardwalk area. I take my kids down there, it's a lot of fun. This is something of an oddity because it was in the middle of the river off Fort Fisher near Southport. It was a quarantine station for incoming sea vessels and was built on concrete pilings by the US government in 1895. It was intended to prevent any number of diseases from reaching the mainland population. Initially comprising four buildings, a hospital, medical officers quarters, a disinfecting house and attendance quarters. It was about a half mile offshore and featured a 600 foot pier. Various quarters, wharves, a 400 foot deep artesian well and other fixtures were added over the years. It was open until 1937, but medical improvements meant onshore facilities were used and the station deteriorated until a fire in 1951 all but wiped it out. Only that concrete platform down there can you see today. I think it would be awesome to see that in the river and visit that if it was still there. What a unique and singular looking building. And here's another one actually. Near Curie Beach, the South End and Fort Fisher is an Air Force station for the 701st Aircraft Control and Warning Squadron. It was built in 1955 and decommissioned in 1988. It was primarily a Cold War radar base. You see it as you go down to Fort Fisher on your right. Um, it featured a nearby airfield and housing. And after 1988, it became an Air Force recreation area and a National Guard training post. The small houses, which used to you know, house 
the various servicemen who went down there have recently been made available to the public to buy so you get your own small house near the beach i like the dome too of the radar station there very interesting looking building i moved to sea breeze and freeman beach intrinsically linked you see sea breeze on the mainland side snows cut to the right of it and then you're into the channel which is actually now part of the intracoastal and then across to the freeman it's called freeman park there but it was freeman's beach historically uh, on the other side of course reachable by boat as far back as 1788 I'll go back there. A free black, uh, Alexander Freeman, fished Myrtle Grove Sound. In 1876, a descendant, Robert Freeman, bought 2,500 acres in the area we're looking at. He left this in parcels to African-American families to work and have water access as well. In 1911, is Roland and Nathan Freeman sought to develop a black resort named Seabreeze. The area's first building was constructed in 1922. And by the 1940s, the area was almost fully developed. By then it was also known as Monte Carlo. At its height as a resort, there were three hotels, 10 restaurants, known locally for their clam fritter specialty, many cottages, a boat pier, duke joint bars, and an amusement park with a Ferris wheel. African-American families, and oh, by the way, that's the plan in the top left, uh, African-American families would come from all over the state and from cities beyond. I hit Philadelphia and Atlanta when I was reading about it at Seabreeze in this, the era of Jim Crow. Freeman's Beach, also owned by the family, was located on the north end of Carolina Beach and a short distance by boat from the resort. During World War II, black GIs filled Seabreeze and it became a hub for music, dance and entertainment. Despite segregation, White kids from Carolina Beach just across the water would come. And sea breeze began to decline when Hurricane Hazel yet again reared her head to destroy buildings and piers in 1954. That only exacerbated the erosion problems from that confluence of snows cut, the 1931 built, um, dig out really, and Carolina Beach, which was created uh, the inlet in 1952. By the 1970s, desegregation had opened other options for African-Americans to travel. And resorts like this were less in fashion. Seabreeze continued to dwindle with each passing storm. And there's very little left down there today of the original stuff anyway. You can see it all right here. But before we leave Seabreeze and Freeman Beach, I'm gonna digress just for a sec, because I wanna share a story that gives a little context to segregation like this at beaches, why you would need a separate resort. And everywhere else really where segregation lived in the Jim Crow South. It comes from the Federal Point Historic um, Preservation Society website, actually I got it from. And it's from the biography, autobiography of Asata Shakur. She was born Joanne Byron and is the granddaughter of Frank and Lulu Freeman Hill, another branch of the Freeman family. She was born in Jamaica, New York. And when she was three, they moved back to Wilmington. Here's the story. When we were on the beach, we shopped at Carolina Beach. It had an amusement park, but of course, black people were not permitted to go in. Every time we passed it, I looked at the merry-go-round and the Ferris wheel and the little cars and airplanes and my heart would just long to ride them. But my favorite forbidden ride had little boats in a pool of water. And every time I passed them, I felt frustrated and deprived. Of course, persistent creature that I am, I always asked to be taken on the rides, knowing full well what the answer would be. One summer, my mother and sister and I were walking down the boardwalk. My mother was spending part of her summer helping my grandparents, that would be the Freemans, in their business. As soon as we were near the rides, I was in my usual act. I continued ad nauseum until my mother grinning said, all right, now I'm gonna try and get us in. When we get over there, I don't want to hear one word out of you. Just let me do the talking. And if they ask you anything, don't answer, okay? So my mother went over to the ticket booth and began talking. I didn't understand a word she was saying. The lady at the ticket window kept telling my mother that she couldn't sell her any tickets. My mother kept talking fast, very fast, and waving her hands. The manager came over and told my mother she couldn't buy any tickets and that we couldn't go into the park. 
My mother kept talking and waving her hands and soon she was screaming this foreign language. I didn't know if she was speaking a play language or a real one. Several other men came over. They talked to my mom. She continued. And after the men went to one side and had a conference, they returned and told the ticket seller to give my mother the tickets. I couldn't believe it. All at once we were laughing and giggling and riding the rides. All the white people were staring at us, but we didn't care. We were busy having a ball. When I got into one of those little boats, my mother practically had to drag me out. I was in my glory. When we finished the rides, we went to the Dairy Queen for ice cream. We sang and laughed all the way home. When we got home, my mother explained that she'd been speaking Spanish and had told the managers that she was from a Spanish-speaking country or a Spanish country. And that if he didn't let us in, she would call the embassy and the United Nations and I don't know who all else. We laughed and talked about it for days, but it was a lesson I never forgot. Anybody, no matter who they were, could come right off the boat and get more rights and respect than American-born blacks. We're going to continue on down to Bald Head Island. So I put this wider map on here to give you an idea of the topography where the coast takes a sharp turn off towards Caswell Beach and Oak Island in that direction, Southport on the land side. And on the right here, Carolina Beach comes all the way down to Curie Beach, past Fort Fisher, and then on to Bald Head Island. I said that Bald Head is no longer an island, of course, because of that uh, filling in, uh, in after the Civil War. It is a barrier island, Bald Head, though situated at the mouth of the Cape Fear, as you see. Sir Richard Grenville likely named the Cape on his expedition through the area in 1585, before going on to establish the famous colony at Roanoke Island. Grenville, uh, his fear was a submerged sandbar, which you can kind of make out off the bottom left-hand corner here, uh, known to its shape as frying, due to its shape as frying pan shoals. These dangerous shoals extend nearly 30 miles from Cape Fear into the Atlantic Ocean and have caught thousands of ships. This is just another angle for you to get the idea of how little of it is actually developed and how little of it is, you know, habitable even on that shot. Primarily when we're here, we're uh, dealing with lighthouses, which are fascinating singular buildings of their own. This is the original light lighthouse from 1794. It was North Carolina's first lighthouse stu stood near the Bald Head or Barren Hill of the island, which is located on the southwest of Smith Island as Bald Head was known at the time. The original lighthouse stood just over 99 feet tall and was the nation's tallest until Old Baldy was built in 1817. Similar to Old Baldy, the original lighthouse was constructed of brick in an octagonal tower. North Carolina's first lighthouse keeper, Henry Long, lit the original lighthouse around Christmas 1794. When New Inlet, that we dealt with, was, had formed in 1761, the river changed its shape and flow, the hydrology, and over years the lighthouse was endangered by the encroaching sea. So it was taken apart in 1813, and a lot of its materials, including the bricks and the lantern room, were recycled to construct its successor, Old Baldy. Bottom left is kind of the view uh, from the tip of that part of the island right now. Boat houses on the island constructed these two, um, the top one, most likely around 1915. The Baldhead Creek Boathouse was north of the island in the saltwater marshes. Lighthouse keepers and life-saving servicemen, which is the precursor of the Coast Guard, used it for travel between the island and the mainland. These federal employees used the creeks to go around the dense island forest to work. In 1997, the Bald Head Creek Boathouse was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Old Baldy Foundation, which runs the museum and the lighthouse, considered the boathouse the most photographed and painted landscape on the island. Unfortunately, of course, it was destroyed by storm surge, as you can see, and high winds caused by Hurricane Florence in September 2018. At the bottom here, the Coast Guard boathouse from 1913 was a new Coast Guard station was constructed on Bald Head's South Beach in that year to replace the former Cape Fear Life Saving Station. The station housed Coast Guardsmen during World War II when German U-boats patrolled the Atlantic uh, up the coast here. 
They were seeking to torpedo cargo ships and oil tankers bound for Europe. Coast Guards patrolled the island's beaches on horseback. An old Baldy lighthouse was used as a radio beacon to report U-boat sightings. This image shows the Coast Guard, um, the main station, sorry, bottom left there, shows the main station, cottages for workers, the boathouse and the cistern. After the conclusion of World War II, the station was abandoned in favor of one across the Cape Fear River on Oak Island. Fire and Baldhead's harsh environment claim most of the building except the, boast, the boat the boathouse over time. In 1972, private owners moved the boathouse inland and adaptively reused it, yay preservation, the structure into one of Baldhead Island's original 17 modern beach houses. Today it remains in private ownership. The light station. This is uh, circa 1903. These panoramic photos, like uh, top right and the one sort of middle right, uh, capture the early 20th century on the tip of the Cape Fear, of the actual Cape Fear. The structures from right to left are the 1882 Life Saving Station, the 1903 Light Station, and the three Light Station Keepers' cottages. In 1882, the federal government constructed a U.S. life-saving station on Cape Fear in order to mitigate the dangers from those frying pan shoals. Surfmen, under the direction of a keeper, monitored the shoals from a lookout tower built on the station's roof and by patrolling the beach on foot. The life-saving station rescued a minimum of 642 lives from 54 shipwrecks between 1883 and 1913 when the station was torn down due to the encroaching beach. In 1903, the federal government constructed Cape Fear Light Station, the skeletal 150-foot lighthouse you see here, on the headland of that Cape Fear. It was a major a seacoast light warning mariners of frying pan shoals. Unfortunately, when Oak Island Lighthouse was completed in 58, the federal government dynamited this light station. A bit dramatic. In 2009, the old Baldy Foundation purchased the lens and pedestal for its collection. You can see the base right here. The light station's keepers' cottages, by the way, are still preserved in place. An old Baldy, which is still there. In 1813, the original lighthouse came down. This is our last stop on our trip, by the way. The winning bidder for the federal contract, Daniel Way, arrived on Baldhead Island in December 1816. Old Baldy, with 110 foot walls in an octagonal shape, combined recycled and newly pressed bricks. Way covered them with protective whitewash stucco. On April 1st, 1817, Way completed Old Baldy, and keeper Sedgwick Springs, a great name, began operations. The lantern, recycled from the older lighthouse course, was fueled by whale oil lamps employing parabolic reflectors to cast light onto the horizon. Old Baldy's lantern received a disastrous performance review by the US Lighthouse Board in 1852, prompting its replacement with new technology called Fresnel lenses. It's still there. It's absolutely wonderful to visit. The 1964 shows you how, photo shows you how empty the island was and the other photos how much developed it is now. Uh, We've been out there with volunteers and it's just a fabulous place to visit and wonderful history as all these places are. That is my show, our show. And I think I'm going to stop sharing and Clarissa will rejoin and we'll open it up to the panel. Um, we need to do a little technical yeah, rearranging yeah. as we do. I hope you all enjoyed that. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, I didn't lose that many people. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Gareth. All um, right. That I'm was gonna fun. Jump in to the chat and the um, Q and A. So you all, if you see down at the bottom of your screen, there's a the Q and A button. You can jump in there. Um, so we'll go ahead and. It started with the Q&A. Um, so our first question is from, um, let's see, well, Kelly Lewis, but she, her question was answered. So um, Taylor Butler, 
Is there a member of the Freeman family alive today? If so, do they still own the Seabreeze property? Anybody? Somebody, I, I can talk, I've talked enough, so somebody else wanna go? <laughs> yes, they are. They're, um, there are a lot of the Freeman family that are left and some do own property at Seabreeze proper, but a developer has gone in and bought a lot of that, a lot of that land and they're building um, really nice houses in there. And most of the Freemans, I would say, live near Seabreeze off of Carolina Beach Road. Actually, um, one of the Freemans is a member of Federal Point Historic Preservation Society, and he came to a meeting, well, back when we were still meeting. <laughs> so the answer is yes, there are Freemans that live there. Um, and I think you, I was gonna say, Gareth, I, I don't know if folks caught, but you, we, we talked about it yesterday, the, the Shakur's, Asada, she's, that's, like the Tupac Shakur's, right? <laughs> Apparently so. Um, yeah. I was told this by somebody, Leslie who works with us at the Bellamy, was telling me that the other day because they were having a dispute with Carolina Beach over access to Freeman Park up there, I think. And I don't know the story, but the, the story that I read, she started off you know, in Jamaica, New York. Her name now is Asada Shakur, and apparently she is a relative of Tupac Shakur, mm -hmm. who I don't know the link beyond that. But apparently, that's there's a connection in that family down there at Seabreeze as well. Well, that is interesting stuff. Um, let's see from Donna Hurdle. I've heard that there are that the structures on Topsail Beach were from World War II. Uh, what are they? Or I guess which which structures or. Anybody know Top Cell Beach history? I didn't go that far, no. <clears throat> I don't. Beverly? You're on mute, by the way. Yeah, you're muted, Beverly. If you know anything about that. Top Cell, I didn't. <laughs> those, those are missile um, encasements. During World War II, um, Camp Davis was not far away, and they were testing missiles there. Isn't there a museum up there, the Missiles and More Museum? It's called Missiles and More Museum, and it's a fantastic place. You should go there sometime. There I've you. never been there. It's, what, what's, what's in it? All kinds of artifacts and photographs and books, and they have a historical society, and Fun. It's not just about the missiles, it's about other local history too. It's right. really quite interesting. I've been to Tufts, I've just not been in that museum and it's called Missiles and More. It just sounds really mm -hmm. fun. Great name. All right, we've got a question from um, Karen Metcalf and she wants to know, are there any structures left from the early 1900s? If so, what are the current preservation efforts? Well, at Wrightsville Beach, there are uh, there are none that are listed as being pre 1900s. Although there are some buildings that have incorporate some of those um, those uh, 19th century buildings, um, and the preservation is that the, most of the ones that are left, the families mm -hmm. do value that. Um, the last one that we lost was the Bleeding Fall, and, um, it, uh, and we did lose that one. But the pressure for, as I said, the land pricing there to redevelop is enormous on beaches. It just is. Uh, Elaine, is anything at Carolina Beach that old? Um, not, not from the, not from the late 1800s. There was a uh, fire in 1940 <clears throat> that destroyed two blocks of. Um, of the boardwalk at Carolina Beach and including the pavilion that designed by Henry Bonnets. And so that would have probably, um, that, that of course was, the second pavilion was built in 1911, 
because the first one burned in 1910. But um, that that destroyed, and and it went, and at that time, the um, well, no, it wouldn't have been at that time. But at one time, the town hall was on was on the boardwalk. The grocery store, A and P, was on the boardwalk. Um, it was the ABC store was on the boardwalk. I mean, you know, it was it was really the town center. And um, but the municipal building, which was built um, in in the early 1940s, as a matter of fact, it opened on President Roosevelt's birthday as a tribute to him and the funds that they got from the. Um, programs that he that he started during after the depression but it was torn down after Bertha and Fran. So there's, but, there's, um, not, there's not much older than 1940s then right from that yeah. fire particularly? Probably not Pro well no. I'm trying to think of individual cottages um I can't I can really can't think of one that's that's prior to 1900. <laughs> is, is Travis are you on he's an old baldy I'm assuming that Old Baldy is the oldest thing out there. Yeah, we have uh, Old Baldy, of course, 1817, but it's important to remember that much of the materials to build Old Baldy are from that previous 1794 lighthouse, as you discussed. And Old Baldy's oil house uh, is pretty close uh, to the 19th century. It was built in 1905. Uh, the lighthouse service after the Civil War was changing its fuel from uh, whale oil, which was um, combustible, but not uh, a fire hazard. And they changed it to mineral oil, which we know is kerosene today. And Old Baldy's nothing but a giant lightning rod. Uh, so uh, they had to build this brick insulated oil house to safely store all the kerosene that was delivered by these lighthouse tenders. Uh, and then we have the three keepers cottages for Cape Fear Light Station that were constructed between 1900 and 1903. Uh, they're all in private ownership today, and we're very fortunate that that homeowner is um, so dedicated to preservation efforts. They were very much beat up during Hurricane Florence, and I'm proud to say that they were um, probably some of the structures out here that uh, were preserved uh, or at least um, fixed the quickest after Hurricane Florence. Like, Many communities, I'm sure the audience out there, uh, Bald Head, we didn't have enough contractors uh, for all the work that needed to be done. So mm -hmm. those being in such dedicated private homes or private hands, uh, they did a really great job responding quickly and rapidly. And uh, they're, they're quite beautiful. You can uh, rent them today and stay out there. It's very secluded out there, right? And it has lots of good ghost stories and pirate stories and things attached. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the, you're looking right out over the graveyard, the Atlantic and the Shoals, and supposedly that's where Aaron Burr's uh, daughter, Theodosia, uh, met her fate aboard this uh, schooner called the Patriot. Now, of course, I know Wrightsville Beach has uh, a version of the story in Cape Hatteras and so forth, but uh, folks out here say the cottages are still haunted by the legend of Theodosia. So there you go, preserve buildings and you can go and stay with the ghost. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, thanks, Travis. Um, so we have a question from Patience Larkin. I noticed you didn't talk about Figure Eight Island. Is that a private island? Is it owned by all the homeowners who live on it now? Anybody else but me? It is a private island. It's a private. Private. <laughs> Yeah, you have to go through a gatehouse to get on it. Uh, you can't get over the bridge unless you have permission. I don't like know who, great. who does own it in, in terms of, I mean, the government, a government presumably owns it, and then everybody buys sections of land, but is it owned, but it's not owned by a private company that owns the whole island, is it? Or? Well, there is a company called Figure Eight Realty that owns a lot of the, um, well, no, it wouldn't, but their office, it's kind of interesting. Their office is in the building where the club, the um, yacht club is for, for uh, figure eight. Right. So I, th I think there's some connections. Mr. Ca the, Mr. Cameron and a couple of other people started that company when they developed um, ball, um, figure eight. And um, 
a friend of mine from high school uh, worked with with him, and he, when he wanted to sell it, she bought it. Judy Parlator owns Figure Eight Realty, and I, I, I think that anything that's rented or sold has to kind of go through them, or at some point. It is definitely a private island, and I think it, you think of it like as a gated community kind of thing, right? It's owned yeah. by people yeah. within it and managed in that way. But if there's a fire, of course, the fire trucks come from, yeah. But it is definitely a private island and, and pretty hard to get onto unless you know somebody or are going to an event out there. Yeah. We have a raised hand and I'm so from Chris Neal. I'm gonna um, unmute you. So if you wanna ask your question, Chris, you can. Well, I'm allowing you to unmute yourself so you can ask your question. Okay. Chris, do you still want to? Okay, I'm trying. I'm okay. old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first of all, Figure Eight Island is not controlled by the government at all. Okay. None. Except for camera regulations, which they have to abide by. Uh, JP Goforth did Figure Eight Island years ago uh, and actually regulated his lot at the very southern end of that island so it didn't have to meet government regulations. Um, if you ever have ever seen the uh, part of the problem with Shell Island is he went in and dredged the inlet to build up his lot to put in a pool. Yeah, if you've ever seen a lot. And he dredged that inlet there and caused part of the problem with, you know, with Shell Island. Anyways. <laughs> okay. So that's the answer to the, how private is that island? It's private. Um, yeah, no, they, they, the government has no control over other than camera regulations that abide by everybody's beachfront property. Okay. They have no control over Figure Eight Island. None. None. Um, the okay. other question. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris, you were saying something else. No, oh, I can't even remember what it was because I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sharing with us about figure eight yeah that was it okay Alrighty. um so we'll go back to the q a section so um we have a question from pat young who oversaw the development of north uh wrightsville beach um i don't know it seems um i think the property families the north end is called Parmalee Isle at one point. The north, um, at Shell Island or at, or the, north, the north end, end, I think, when, when it, got, yeah, after the the north fire, it got redeveloped that way. It was, it was a realty company, the Parmalee. We, I, I always called it, we all I always heard it called Parmalee Isle. Yeah. From, from, from where the um, surf club is north. North. I really don't know. <laughs> Maybe um, some family and development. Yeah, that makes sense because there's a road up there with that name. And, yeah. You know, you well, has been is a name that's been part of Wrightsville Beach for quite a while. That would be at least a second generation because in 1940, when um, they brought the um, cars over, Parmalee was one of the local people who had property at Wrightsville Beach who donated it to be a parking lot. Mm -hmm. So the Parmalees have been there a while. In the very north end, the Shell Island Resort is there now is 1980s. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, by the time we got all the way up to the end and the development reached that far. Yeah. All right, we have a question from Cindy Wilson. I think this is a, a good one. Um, is there a book about the old hotels and clubs interested in the history and architecture? I'm sure there are. Who, who wants to plug their book? <laughs> well, I was thinking, I was like, this is a... Beverly. There, Beverly. Uh, then, we'll do, then we'll do a lane. 
Lost But Not Forgotten, um, which you can get, uh, there's a new, the paper edition is out of print, but there's a new edition that you can read, an ebook edition that you can download from Amazon. And the better, the best thing about an ebook is you can blow up the picture so big that you can actually see if there are people in the windows. Doesn't Elena. that have like a hundred more pictures on top 100. of the print? The print it has a hundred more print. pictures, yeah. Okay. And an extra chapter. Yeah. And Elaine, your book? Well, <clears throat> my book is um, a postcard history of Carolina Beach. And the biggest drawback to that book is that it's all in sepia color, black and white. It's there, no, no color at all, which if you've ever seen a, you know, a postcard, the color is, is a big part of it because most of them, especially the early ones were hand colored. And sometimes the, the colors are, are very vibrant, but at any rate, um, you can buy that at, um, you can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it at Barnes and Noble. Usually, um, Books A Million has it in other places. Um, and I'd also kind of like to plug our website at F Federal Point Historic Preservation Society. We have um, a lot of postcards and a lot of images online. And um, whenever I'm Googling anything about, <clears throat> about something down at Carolina and Cary Beach, um, what comes up is our historical society. At least the first four or five entries are from, because we have a volunteer who has, has put most of our archives online. So it's very easy to search. So That's where I got that story from. I think I yeah. mentioned that, but yeah. there's more to that. There's like six pages of Seabreeze history. Oh yeah, that's, yeah that's that, that, there's, a lot, there's a lot about Seabreeze. Rebecca <clears throat> Taylor is, has done a lot of work on that on the sea breeze part. It's a, it's a fascinating story. And yeah, there's, there's a ton on that website. Yeah, there is. Yeah. There is. Um, there's another Arcadia book that has, talks about the North Carolina beaches um, in our area that has a lot of great photographs. And sometimes the photographs are some of the best ways to look at the architecture. Um, there's also a book by Ray McAllister that's about Wrightsville Beach that talks mm -hmm. some about um, architecture and the architects of the area. The Luminous Island, isn't that the name of his? Luminous Island? Luminous Ray. Island, yes. Ray, yeah. History of Riceville Beach. I thought Henry Bonnets designed every last thing on every island. Everywhere <laughs> I went, he was in. <laughs> All right, um, we've got a question from Lucy Grist. I'd like to hear about the frying pan building pier that I understand is now Pro Alert owned. Is that true? Frying pan pier? Is that frying Northern pan Island? Pan tower slash pier. Oh, oh, tower, frying pan tower. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it was at one point a, it was um, like a hotel or a weekend getaway or you had to, um, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure exactly how you got out there, helicopter, I guess. Elaine, do you want to describe what it is? Because it's kind of, if people don't know, it's a weird, funky building. Well, it used, yeah, it, it used to be, there used to be a frying pan light ship, which it, it was essentially a lighthouse, but it was a ship. And, and um, then they ended up doing something like a really big, huge buoy. And, um, and they, it was called frying, frying pan light tower. And um, it looks like a little oil rig. It looks like it a little oil rig. Yeah, it was decommissioned as a, as a lighthouse. And so somebody bought it and they tried to make it like a air, like a B and B, like a bed and breakfast out of it. But I don't know how successful they were. And I'm not even sure it's still in, in operation, but you can Google it and find out. Yeah, it's, yeah, it, it's, it looks like a little oil rig you can go and stay at, or you could. And yeah. it was just, and it's in the middle of the ocean. In the middle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that the thing where they're always showing the flag where the when the hurricanes are? Yeah. yeah, they're always have the flag out there, and that's like the gauge of how bad yeah. <laughs> the hurricane is, and how much the flag on the top of that shakes. Okay, so that's good. Callie Givens, who's out at Old Baldy, just wrote on there that it's still open as a B and B. 
Hmm. So you still go out there. It's got to be a bit crumbly by now. I don't know if I'd want to risk going out and staying on a steel structure in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, that, that's kind of a little rusty. <clears throat> but it's a great example of, you know, showing how treacherous the, the shoals are around here and how yeah. far they go out. I mean, to think that, you know, that far out, you have to have something out there to warn people um, about, um, about the shoaling. Yeah, when you get out there on, on Bullhead and you look out there and you see some sand and you see the breakers, and then I think it was Travis gave us the tour not long ago, 30 miles of that out into the sea, you're like, and you don't see much of it, 30 miles, you're like, oh, okay. No wonder everybody crashes into it. Yeah. And there are times of year between Charleston, South Carolina and um, Norfolk where, you know, you, you can't get insurance for a boat, <laughs> certain <laughs> types of boats because it's the weather, when the weather is bad, it's just impossible to see the shoals and then they move so much, so fast. Yeah, they move because it's just sandbars, right, yeah. yeah. All right, so we've got a couple just comments or, or answers to questions from uh, Tony Ribbonbark and Paul yeah. Stevens about the um, Topsail Island and the missiles. So um, Tony said, the concrete towers on Topsail Island were for observation of missile testing launches. Mm -hmm. And then Paul says those are missile tracking towers, um, missiles just after World War II, ramjets and German technology was tested out. Um, so it's more on that. And then um, Paul Stevens also says, my grandfather B. Stephen was an architect for the expansion of the Terry Moore Hotel. Could you go over the expansion as you understand it in more detail? Um, Wilmington Dispatch, February 10th, 1910 is my source of information, but not clear what was done then. Um, well, the Terry Moore was there. And then what, one of the things they did was they put the, um, the, the most obvious things they put up were the turret. Yeah, um, the big Queen Anne Tower, yeah. Big piece um, that was right there at Station One. And the other thing they did was put the um, octagonal, what they called it first called the tea room that was right on the ocean. So um, those big pieces were put in there really to, you know, create a real visual impact as you come right to the beach the very first, at the very first stop. Elaine, do you have more information? Um, I was going to say that they also did two very long wings and the wings were not exactly the same length. But if you, if you look at pictures of the um, oceanic from the ocean, looking, looking back <clears throat> toward Banks Channel, you can see those. And of course, the octagonal building you were talking about is usually visible then too. Yeah. And um, let's see, Riceville Beach Magazine did a, an article um, that that featured a lot of thing a lot of things about the oceanic and it was called a century of dining and i'm not sure what what year or what month but i think you could google it and um the cover page is two pages and it's a beautiful um it's a big blow up of a postcard of the oceanic at night <clears throat> and the twinkling lights i mean it's a beautiful beautiful postcard and anyway i did a lot of uh I did a program on that, on a century of dining at Wrightsville for you, Madeline, at the Wrightsville Beach Museum. And then Wrightsville Beach Magazine ended up writing an article. And one of the most interesting things that I found when I was doing research was a, was a copy, was a newspaper article about a health, a health inspector report from the state of North Carolina who happened to be there. Now, the, I think that's, a few days before that, the Seashore Hotel, I think that fire was maybe 1919. I think so. Is that right, Madeline? Yeah. And anyway, so uh, most of the people at the Seashore Hotel had to go, had to go take up any empty rooms at the Oceanic that they could. So there, it, it was, I mean, the place was packed and they probably didn't have enough staff and, and so forth. And it just so happens that this health inspector came at that time and it is it's really kind of funny to read um i know she said that or he said that in the lobby there was a big water cooler with one glass 
And that was what, and that was, and everybody had to use that one glass. And then he said that when he had dinner there the first night, that his, his, his ice water had floating pieces of fish in it. And it just goes on and on. It's, 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 it's really funny. And, and uh, I think ex excerpts of that are in that, in that article, but um, it was really a beautiful hotel and they that had orchestras that played just like Lumina. Matter of fact, some of the orchestras that played at Lumina also played at the Oceanic or they would stay at the Oceanic and play, play at both places. I was saying in that thing that they called the streetcar down the road and played at Lumina, the one you're on about, right? That the picture that you're talking about is, I think I showed you that one, that one, right? The yeah. nighttime one. That's it. Yeah. With all the lights on inside. The light is appalling here, but you know, you get the idea. Yeah. It's that one. That is a beautiful postcard at night. Yeah. And the way that the wings were set up were so that every room could have an ocean. advertised as an ocean. Breeze. Breeze. So. Um, so we have a question from Tamad Ferguson. Um, quite informative and well presented. Uh, what type of materials does the beach consist of? Sandy, loamy, mangroves, etc. Are there any significant changes to the natural landscape of the area apart from the military landfill action? Are all of the buildings which are preserved available for public viewing? Um, the beaches have been restored, quote unquote restored, you know, year after year. Um, it's all sand. Um, we have a sandy beaches here. And um, people who are here, who've lived here for many years, talk about the fact that the sand is not the same. It's not as fine as it used to be. And part of that is because they're digging it up from out in the middle of the Atlantic and bringing it here to um, supplement what is, has been lost over time with, and, and every year with storms and erosion. So the, it's a sandy beach. Um, we've had the intercoastal waterway um, dredged in. We've filled in Moore's Inlet. Um, you look at the beach, the maps of Wrightsville Beach over the years and you can see exactly where they have, you know, bulkheaded areas to keep it from eroding and they have added um, added sand to lay out some more streets and sell some more um, houses. So the land around here, by nature, um, they're barrier islands. So they have they have been changing since day one, since you know for millennia, um, they have been changing. But um, in addition to that, we have done multiple times. We have tried to keep it the way we want it. And so um, the configurations changed, um, have been changed by my people uh, often. Yeah. Is that the, that answer the question or? Yeah. Yes, I think so. On, on the back side, I don't know if you said this, but the back side of those, that island is um, sort of a salt marsh, right, as well. Mm -hmm. and the intracoastal waterway, and then when you get to the, the land side, the mainland side on the other side of the intracoastal, it's creeks and things like that and very marshy, really rich like wildlife out there too. I go kayaking out there sometimes. It's just beautiful to get out into all that sort of stuff and go around those islands. Great, thanks Gareth. Um, so we've got a few more questions and then um, I apologize if we don't get to your question, but you can always join us the after party uh, for more discussion, but we'll just get to these last few. Um, do you have any more information about the small houses at Fort Fisher? Those... Yeah, the, the ones on the Air Force Base sort of thing? Okay, is that, that's the-, the I, I'm assuming that's what it means. Beverly, do you want to talk about it? Because you've, did we do a plaque on one of them? Well, we did a plaque on one that was moved. Mm, it was moved. That, a lot of them were moved um, after World War II and they were called hutments. And you can see them all over. Some of them were barracks, some of them were hutments. And you can see them all over Curry and Carolina Beach. And my business partner, Dan, he has one that was raised and we put a historic Wilmington Foundation plaque on his. 
And you can, if you are in the military, you can rent one of the, the houses that are there now. Um, I have a cousin whose husband was in the Air Force and they rented one and had a really nice stay there. And, you know, y'all know Amy Hotz that used to work at the yeah. Star News. Amy and Steve stay down there a lot when they come home too. So they're rentable as well. They're rentable and they're, they're built, they're redoing them. They're building sort of modern bungalows. There's also a museum there. Yeah, yeah. A very nice museum. A military museum, right? In yes. The back? Yeah. All right, thank you, Beverly. Um, this question is from Barbara Bush. Ever heard of the Nautilus on Wrightsville Beach? My grandmother started it, and I think it was one of the first restaurants. Her name was Sarah Williams Johnson. Johnston. Elaine, you did the you did the series on the restaurant. Yeah, it's, it, it was it was one of the restaurants that we featured in that in that um, a century of dining at Wrightsville. The building is still there. It is. Um, if, as you go over the Bank, Banks Channel Bridge and you see wings, just to the right of wings, there is a, a, a building that has a lot of glass, it's kind of a triangular shaped building and has a lot of glass block at, at where the apex would be. And it's called, it's a dress shop and it's called Hallelujah. And that, that is the, the former Nautilus restaurant. So the building is still there. And when I lived at Wrightsville Beach, um, when I first started teaching school, um, it was a laundromat and the, the apartment that, that, or the house that I rented had a washing machine, but it didn't have a dryer. And so most of the time, you know, that was not a problem, but if I needed something, to, if I needed like for sheets and towels, I would go down to the laundromat, which was that same building where the Nautilus was. And if you look up that article in Wrights of Reach magazine on a century of dining, you will see, um, I think there are pictures of that, but it was definitely in my presentation. So it, the building is still there, which is kind of amazing because it sits right down on the on the ground and you know that it's been flooded any number of times. Wow, thanks Elaine. Um, all right, last three questions. So from Kelly Lewis, is there any more recent information about Wrightsville Beaks, like the history of the theater? I remember it being a bar at one time, maybe 30 years ago. I'm not sure what it is now. The, um, the main book that we have that is still in print is the, um, the book by Ray McAllister. And it's called Luminous Island, Writes the History of Wrightsville Beach. And um, there is information in there. Um, we, the museum had a book that has been out of print a couple of years, uh, but they're available at the library. So there's, there's, a, there's information out there. Thanks, Madeline. Um, from Robert um, Rossier, any history known about the Joy Lee Apartments in Carolina Beach? Yeah, the, the, the Joy Lee is, is I, th I think it's, it's the only place on Carolina Beach that's on the National Register Registry. Um, it was built by Grover Lee. Um, let's see. Well, that, no, let's see, his, his daughter is named, he named it for his daughter, who was Joy Lee Bordeaux, and that's her married name. Um, but at any rate, he had a, he had a, a system of, of making these railings out of concrete, and, and a, a lot of times they were circles, circles of concrete. And if you see the, if you see pictures of the Joy Lee, you can see those old circular those, those railings um, that, that are up on the balconies are going like going up somewhere, you know, to a second story, the original ones. And he cast those, they were his own invention, his own idea, and he made casts for them. And he, and he made the concrete and then he, he somehow put it all together. And um, it's, 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 it's an art deco building. It's kind of stucco. And here's another one that sits right on the ground. And you know that it has had, it's right across from the ocean. It's on Carolina Beach Avenue North. You can ride down there and see it anytime. It's painted um, 
uh, yellow and it has turquoise accents and it's really it's really a great building. Um, it's in my book. <laughs> All right, thanks, Elaine. Um, and then our last question is from um, Charlene Wilson. Have you seen any of the old hand-drawn maps of this coast drawn in the 1500s or the 1600s where there's an area called Cape Fair rather than Cape Fear? That's Travis. Is Travis still on? Yeah, hey, uh, I'm, I'm here. I just can't be on video, but uh, right. yeah, Charlene, um, we have many copies of these early maps, uh, copies uh, at the Old, Bound Old Baldy Foundation. It's really curious. Uh, Cape Fear goes by a variety of names and spellings throughout history, along with the island complex that we know today as Baldhead. It's been called Cedar Island, Cape Island, Smith Island, Palmetto Island, Bluff Island, Middle Island, which are variations of Baldhead Island. Uh, it can get quite confusing because it's just the same geographical point. It all depends what your background is, what your nationality is, and what time period you are in, uh, which name you refer to the island comp complex as. Um, the Edward Mosley map, which is a 1733 map, it's uh, held up at the um, up at East Carolina University. Uh, that's one of the first occasions where it seems that Cape Fear becomes a, a standardized fear, as in how we spell it today. Although um, there are certainly instances later than 1733 when we have a lot of variations as well. Well, I would just like to say some of the some of those original maps are in the North Carolina room at the New Hanover County Public Library. Mm -hmm. They are copies as well as some originals. There's one wonderful one that shows um, a map before the hurricane that put New Inlet in. That's an original. Somebody had mentioned earlier about filling it in and can you walk up there? Uh, I did it in, in late March, uh, and as Elaine had said in the chat, uh, you definitely don't want to try it any time other than a few hours before and after low tide because you are going to get quite wet and it can be quite dangerous out there. Um, Corn Cake Inlet, I've heard so many different um, uh, descriptions of when that officially filled in. This is a smaller inlet. Uh, that's just south of New Inlet. And uh, my observations in March, it doesn't take much more than a king tide or a few feet of storm surge and Baldhead is definitely separated from Pleasure Island uh, by at least a, a little bit of water. So it's a, it's a very dynamic peninsula that's changing almost daily. So uh, you never know really what it looks like unless, unless you've been out there that day. Hey, Travis, did you walk the whole thing from Baldhead to Curie or Fisher or something? Yeah, well, there was nothing else to do in late March when we were all in lockdown. Right, right, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, I do it this it took, weekend. Uh, <laughs> it took six hours, and it's uh, 18 miles from the last beach access at Baldhead Island to the Fort Fisher Monument and back. Um, so it, it's really an incredible journey. I would invite anybody to do it, either walking or running or um, a bicycle if you plan it again at low tide. Uh, it, it's a really fun excursion. The closest thing that I believe it looks like is if you're familiar with Ocracoke. When you get out of the village of Ocracoke on the way to the ferry over Hatteras Inlet, it looks very, very similar to that landscape up there. That's beautiful up there, so yeah. That's interesting. So I was reading about, you know, or talking about rather the filling in and then the rebuilding. There's a whole story about filling in New Inlet as well with the Army Corps and Henry Bacon Jr. Senior and all of that kind of stuff. There's also there's loads more stories about this stuff. So hopefully everybody will dig in. All right, folks. Well, that was our, our last question for the webinar. Um, and I've posted the link to our after party um, will be on there for a little bit um, after this if you have other questions or want to chat some more about um, our coastal architecture please join us there and I wanted to also mention if you can be sure to um, respond to that survey 
um, that will help us out a lot. And then I'm gonna, if you can't get to the chat, uh, if you'll look in the uh, reminder email that you got about this webinar, the link to the Zoom meeting is also there. Should have gotten one today and about and yesterday and if you registered that earlier uh, a week before so um that's what we'll be thank you all thank you to gareth thank you to our panelists and thank you all for coming um and hopefully we'll see you at another shelter series event this will be available um the recording of this will be available on our website um very shortly and uh as soon as i hit in and it'll be on Facebook as well. Um, so look forward to seeing you all on the other side. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye, y'all. Bye,